Hi, I'm Anderson Brown. Uh, it's a breezy spring day here in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, uh, and it's uh, the semester's over. And I wanted to um, take it's a nice, quiet Saturday afternoon. So I just want to take a few uh, minutes to talk about something because I taught the metaphysics the seminar last semester, and there was something that just came up while we're going through the. The book I used Michael Lou's this semester I used Michael Lou's book on metaphysics, and, um, which I like. But uh, I wanted to talk about a particular topic today that I got to thinking about by the end of the semester. So I thought while the topic was fresh, that uh, I just spend a few minutes talking about my impressions. This is really a pretty informal deal about um, what I'm what I want to call event ontology. Um, you will also have the same discussion if you look at process philosophy. It might be that in formal philosophical circles, uh, process philosophy might even be the more, um, the, the phrase that people use the most. I forget what the Stanford Online Encyclopedia says. Pro I bet they say process philosophy. I'm saying event ontology. Um, I'm not particularly interested in quibbling about the differences between the phrase process philosophy and event ontology. I'm going to explain um, what it means, but it's basically as the name implies, and I'm sure it's something that anyone with passing interest in philosophy has heard of, it, by the way, is uh, the view that really the fundamental metaphysical fact about the world is, um, is something that's in motion is some kind of change. There's a lot of contact here, really interesting contact with ancient Greek philosophy. So I hope as I go along, although I'm really not, I'm, you know, I'm really just going to share some, some thoughts with you here, but I, th I hope we got some of that out too. So um, event ontology, traditional Western metaphysics is object ontology. Again, there's the idea that, well, you have these stable objects. You have, you have a universe and the universe is maybe like a place that's got stuff inside or even say, um, you know, someone commented that the universe isn't like the bottle that holds the beer. I mean, you can think of the universe just as all the things that are in the universe. But if you think of it that way, then again, you're thinking that there are these stable entities, these objects, and there's you have sort of a list of them, and that would be all the stuff in the universe, right? Something, something like that. Um, so primary being atoms like the, um, the Milesian, thinkers like Heraclitus uh, or later on someone like uh, Democritus in the ancient Greek scene. There has to be a bottom level of reality, right? You have maybe, for example, somebody might think <clears throat> as part of their discussion, there has to be some sort of place where you have to stop dividing. So whatever you get that you can't divide, you know, the object any further, that's going to be the smallest particle of being or something like that. And then, of course, then we have earth, air, fire and water and this kind of chemical alchemical discussion about the basic elements and their relationships to each other. Uh, maybe all the elements contain each other and that kind of stuff. Again, a, a view of things that what you're talking about are these sort of stable entities or categories of things. And that of course is also going to be a reflection not only of the sort of metaphysical attitude, but also of the language, the language that is a kind of object sort of noun language. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, again, making these, I take this to be very broad points. Um, so the subjects are conceived as stable physical things that undergo changes. I have in parenthesis there on that first bullet point that modern physics is far beyond this, which indeed it is. And of course, you know, uh, the idea, for example, that the object is mostly empty space um, back from the days when what pop physics was, was a kind of a atom model, these little atoms, uh, and they had lots of empty space between them. You might remember that discussion. Um, the things aren't what they, what they seem. I do think here that it's, again, I'm going to talk about this in the next slide. Now, speaking as a philosopher, I do think that, you know, there is some question here as to whether the philosopher's metaphysical discussion here might get to be a little gratuitous around um, some topics like the nature of matter or something like that. In physics, I mean, as I understand it, by the way, this would be an argument that I, that I would make, is that if someone says they want to be a materialist, um, nowadays, what physics tells us matter is something very strange and complicated that I don't understand very well, so I'm not really even sure what you, what you would be buying 
by saying that you were a materialist. So that was another kind of um, part of the discussion that what we're talking about here um, ties into. So second bullet point, there is this strain though, although it is you know true enough and fair enough and why we're here that uh, you've got this sort of object ontological attitude of Western philosophy. It does contrast with Asian philosophy. And I'm gonna talk about Asian philosophy just really, really briefly during this video. Um, but there's always been a kind of process philosophy. It's debatable, that is, it's debated who exactly are the process philosophers. I do think that Heraclitus is one, but I, as I mentioned, I think in, in the ancient Greek physical scene in general, the question was all about change. Aristotle um, is all about explaining change. That's what his book, The, the Physics, is all about. There's an argument as to whether he's a process philosopher or something else, but those are nets I'm not interested in picking. If you look though at the Stoic tradition really, which is a long, long tradition all through the classical period, all through the Roman period uh, and on, you have um, something that's really clearly a process philosophy in uh, a sense that matches up to Asian philosophy in as much as you've got um, a, a teaching that you need to be in touch with the flow of nature. You, you know, your, your issue is to be coordinated with the rest of the flowing nature in the right kind of way. That's very much stoic teaching. And I think that's also very much as sort of broadly speaking, a, a point that you're gonna find in Asian philosophy. Um, in contemporary philosophy at the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century, Alfred North Whitehead was a prominent expositor of process philosophy. So that would be someone to look at. The third bullet point there, uh, what, let me be clear. The idea that I'm thinking of here mostly is the claim that the universe, the cosmos itself is an event, right? That the right way to think about uh, what there is, what there exists, what the word universe refers to is to think of it as, as an event and not as an object. I already mentioned, you know, you might not, you, you know, you might think of it as an empty space that might or might not have things in it, but in object ontology you might more sensibly say that the, what you're calling the universe are all of those objects. Um, you know, the event ontology says that that, what you're calling the universe, everything that exists is an event. <clears throat> um, so, um, so we're talking about the implications of that way of putting things. Let me see what this last bullet point is. Metaphysics ought to be at least consistent with the best current physical science. But remember, we're, th <coughs> we're thinking mostly here about concepts of logic. That is the thing um, I would say by way of mea culpa. I mean, if you think metaphysics sounds like a kind of far out sort of thing to be talking about at all, uh, think about semantics, right? So. So just to use some really obvious examples, you have sort of say religious talk, some, some friend of yours is talking to you about God, about angels. Uh, so you're saying, well, what do you mean by that? And that's sort of, you know, again, it's semantics. You're asking, what is it you mean? But you're getting into claims about the sorts of things that exist. So as I said, sometimes we want to get metaphysics on the ground, get our feet on the ground with it. You might think that, you, know, you might look, well, we're really talking about uh, semantics, like if we ask, for example, what beliefs and desires are, maybe that's, maybe we don't have to um, be so grandiose to say that's a metaphysical question. Maybe we can just ask what is it that we mean by the words belief and desire. So, all right, that's the, that's what I'm trying to say. Although um, here, and I believe I'm going to talk about this right now, I really am actually uh, myself rather skeptical that uh, professional metaphysics can sort of um, uh, sort of sidestep the implications. But anyway, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. What's the claim exactly? It's easy enough to say that objects are events. It looks like if I say uh, that the universe is an event, then it looks like the things that you're, we're calling objects are events. Um, noticing the universe is an event though might be different from saying that there's something that's a universe that has all kinds of little events in it the way you might say that there's a universe that has all kinds of different things in it. Um, you know, that would be different than saying that the universe itself was an object of some kind. Um, that's debatable, but, uh, but that's the sense of it. And again, here the claim, remember, is that the, I'm asking the question, well, what if the universe itself is best conceived of and talked about as an event, right, basically. 
It's easy enough to say objects are events or everything is an event, but this is a conceptually radical idea. And so it's obscure. It's obscure because you have to sort of decide to think about things uh, as if the universe is an event instead of an object. So you have to work on that. It's not obvious what that means at first, which is, of course, the exact reason to think about it. Uh, second bullet point, the claim that the universe is an event, it looks like it entails that some dynamic property like movement or change. Uh, I noticed writing that, you know, Aristotle has a number of different kinds of, um, uh, of kinds of movements and kinds of change. Uh, I'm, I'm just talking about in general, what we mean when we say that something's dynamic, it's in, it's in motion, it's changing. Uh, the claim of event ontology is that somehow that is a fun, the fundamental quality of being. Maybe, you know, or maybe that means that you're not talking about being anymore at all. I mean, you know, well, you can say, well, I'm talking about becoming rather than being. Uh, will do. Lots of people do that. Um, okay. I'm talking about becoming. I'm talking about a thing that is becoming. Or I'm just talking about becoming itself. I don't have answers to pull out of my pocket about these questions. You know, these are the issues. Um, third bullet point, negatively, it's a claim that there's no underlying substance, right? That is to say, it might be a usefully destructive claim that there are certain things that physicists and metaphysicists ought maybe not to be trying to do. Um, uh, and one of those might not be trying to look for sort of, sort of bottom level of reality. And that goes to something in philosophy of science, uh, reductive materialism, right, is the view that somehow there's a continuum of explanation, there's a unity of science such that ultimately you're going to get a uh, kind of ground level of description. Um, and uh, it looks to me like an event ontology sort of undermines that in that sense. Uh, that it looks as if it's since fundamental being is something that's more like change than what we usually think of as being, which is like an object, right? Then, then the project, the explanatory project itself is something, is something different. And as I say, uh, it's hard to conceive, but let's give credit, to, but let's, let's be dubious about, um, uh, philosophy and notice that you know, yeah, physics looks to have a unified, when you talk about the unified model of physics trying to get all the different forces, gravity and the rest of them all in some sort of coherent uh, relationship. So the, the model is a model of forces. Newton is describing a force. Uh, he can give you the, the equation and you can put in the variables. He understands what, uh, what the equation is. It's a force. So last sentence, ordinary language, nouns as sentence objects. Um, vivo en Puerto Rico y puedo hablar español un poquito y paso bastante tiempo trabajando con la lengua española y ellos dicen que la lengua española es una más activa, una lengua más activa como inglés. Uh, more like a verb, the things are more verby in Spanish than in English. And I see what they mean because learning Spanish is all about learning about this um, uh, stem changing verb conjugation structure that it has as a romance language. Uh, so you know, an interesting thing to think about, I think I mentioned that before as well, that, that among other things here, you wanna look at uh, the way that the, what, what Wittgenstein would call the, the, the metaphysical grammar of your language. If you say that you have beliefs and desires especially if you start to say things like you have them in your head, then you know, what looks like figurative language is really possibly gonna take you on a ride. Ordinary language reflects our phenomenal experience of stable, categorizable, three-dimensional objects in three-dimensional space. Pragmatically, this is not negotiable. And so, you know, this is the most skeptical I'll get here. Our interest here is in how event ontology addresses problems in philosophical metaphysics. Okay, and I think if you stick with me here, you'll see that um, that it does. But um, other than that, I mean, because after all, I mean, the, the, the phenomenal world is, you know, what I'm mostly, I don't know, interested in. I mean, um, there's limited, what I'm saying is it very, it seems like there's very limited application of this, but let's talk about it. Speaking as a philosopher myself, this looks to me like an area where it's reasonable to ask whether our contemporary physical science isn't doing a good enough job of answering these conceptual questions. Maybe it just is. 
um, if something tangible is going to be relevant to the assertion that the universe is an event, right? You're going to get some sort of actual uh, experiential, intersubjectively confirmable, quantifiable reason. Uh, maybe that's maybe it's just a question of choosing a gestalt, and maybe there isn't anything like some sort of uh, experimental evidence that's going to show you that things are events rather than objects, or objects rather than events. Mm -hmm. Um, but if there is, it's going to be cosmological. And yeah, sure enough, uh, astrophysics mostly does cosmology today. And that's fine with me. I just read popularizations of it and try to understand it as well as I can. So in fact, second bullet point, the first kind of substantial argument here is, is critiquing academic metaphysics for being so hidebound. You know, some of it's just clearly not so it's clearly kind of fusty and musty and just assuming that it's talking about objects. I mean, after all, we want to talk about the metaphysics of concrete particulars. Um, so yeah, you know, absolutely. And then, but then last bullet point on the slide, it's also true that um, even if, even if we say, okay, uh, we'll go with physics, it's got the right kind of authority here, which it may well do. And, you know, that's giving us an event ontology. So that's good enough for us. But then it, you know, it's not the job of the experimentalist then to start to talk about, you know, what that says for aesthetics and ethics and philosophy of mind and psychology and so on. And I think there are some other things that we can say. So that's the second part. First part is saying, yeah, you know, look at physics and try and get a little bit up to speed there. But but the second part is, you know, and then let's talk about the the uh, implications and applications of that. So the one that's uh, the most substantial is about the metaphysics of time. Again, you could have a sort of absolute model of time like Isaac Newton did, where you have sort of the notion of a kind of uh, three-dimensional grid that's got fixed locations in it, um, or you could have a relational view of time. Uh, event ontology supports a relational view of time. That is, time is a function of the unfolding of the event. It's not it gets too culty there. What's the event? I'm just saying that the universe is an event, so let's call the universe the event. It's an event, um, and it's happening. Is Hegel a process philosopher like this? I guess so. I don't know Hegel very well. Um, but Aristotle in the physics has a wonderful discussion of what he, what, what was called the continuum. You know, Aristotle takes the sort of universe of experience as sort of the datum, the thing that's there to be explained. He's not one of these philosophers who's trying to show you that everything isn't what it seems. He's not really, that's not the, the turn of his thought. Um, that is, uh, he says, look, you have a surface and because you have a surface, then you have a place actually. Uh, the, the words you often translate as place and then you have a place, then you have sort of distance and and with distance then uh you can get movement from uh, and what is time but a motion of movement what is but a but a but a description um of movement right time a kind of representation of movement movement if you will itself kind of a a function of there being a place a space to move across and space also a relational theory that is aristotle says you have a surface. Once you have a surface, then you have coordinates, contra Newton, contra the absolutist theory of space. Uh, Aristotle says, no, you have, you need a spec. <laughs> Aristotle says, you've got, you know, the physical universe, it has a surface, therefore there is space and there is time. He has a relational view of time. Event ontology has something very similar to that. How does that go with event ontology? Well, what you're, what we call time on an event ontology, one that says that the universe is an event, then what you have are different stages, if you will, of the event. Could they be cut into time slices? Is there a dimension of time so that, uh, the, like a physical object that's spread across time as well as spread across space? No, there isn't anything like that. There is only the present moment because all there is is just the event and all time is is just a way of describing the event it's a function of the dynamic nature of the event that you can sort of measure it that way but what you're measuring is the unfolding of the event you're measuring this change uh, in some 
you know, pragmatic way for yourself, <laughs> for a being with a body like you do. Um, so uh, second bullet point, as I say, presentism, what's presentism? Presentism, the view that only the present moment exists and the concomitant view that objects exist wholly and completely here in the present versus the alternative view that uh, time might be a temporal dimension such that uh, particular objects in time are spread across time the same way that uh, three-dimensional objects are spread across three-dimensional space like our bodies are. Uh, this is the, if event ontology undoes all that, all that goes away because the event ontology says the universe is an event. And again, what you're calling time is really just a description of this ongoing unfolding of this event. There isn't any sort of absolute time that exists apart from that. Okay. Um, event ontology does not sustain reference to concrete particulars like object ontology does, obviously enough. But then uh, another thing that it definitely implies, but I find a little more difficult to unpack, it does sort of imply a kind of holism that everything in the universe is kind of really um, interconnected. Think of it, say you had an object, you could have an object ontology and say that the universe was really just one big object and that it was some kind of, you know, that that was the, say, enlightened or spiritual view um, and that it was just part of our phenomenal reality, but not as real to see that there are all these different objects. So if you could say that, I mean, um, just take the your physical object model of the universe and say, okay, well then there's but there's one big object which just is the universe. Um, okay, um, <clears throat> so so on this view, then again, you just don't have um, you know you don't have physical particulars. Uh, okay, the language of mind, traditional philosophy of language, of course, just like. Remember, we were already talking about the way that the um, nouns, concrete nouns, just refer to physical objects, and um, philosophy of language works that way. Um, you have a conventional symbol. Remember, the symbol has a kind of meaning on the conventional view. You can kind of open up the symbol, if you will, and the meaning is kind of magically inside the symbol. The symbol works by referring, it sort of paints a picture of the world. And Something that goes along with that is this Cartesian picture of the representational mind. What the mind is doing is creating a representation of the world, constructing a mental picture. The goal of the mental picture is corresponding to reality. Truth is whether your mental representation corresponds to reality. So you notice the connection between that attitude towards language and meaning and reference and object ontology. There's an object and let's be objective and we have to get the object uh, delineated properly. That is, our delineation has to correspond to the way the object really is. Um, second bullet point, there is an empiricist alternative to this, meta this metaphysics of meaning in the philosophy of language. And that is sometimes called um, functional role semantics. That sounds like a mouthful, but I think I can explain it just very quickly that uh, you're just doing things with language when you interact and use your language to interact with other people. You know, rather than thinking that a word, say, has a fixed meaning, like the one that you look up in the dictionary, remember language is use, usage and it's constantly changing and constantly evolving. Uh, and so what is it really doing? What are you really doing with language? You're trying to get things done in the world. That is, meaning is use is the slogan kind of pragmatic or utilitarian view of the way that that language works. So rather than this sort of passive uh, project of just constructing the formally correct referring symbol that's going to then be the way that you refer to this fixed thing that exists in the world. In fact, you have lots and lots of different things that you're doing with language all the time. And the right way of conceiving it is not as trying to paint a picture of the world. And finally, then on that bullet point, you know, uh, then taking that to philosophy of mind, of course, you know, everyone is naturalist enough these days. We don't much do with immortal souls and that sort of thing. But still, there are all kinds of Cartesian intuitions all the time. This is kind of a 
a hobby horse of mine that I talk about in a number of the other videos. Um, again, Aristotle, I think, does a really nice job there. You're talking about you have an organism, it's got a life cycle, and what you're calling the mind is really uh, a description of these phases of the organism going through its life cycle. And uh, that's a real interesting take that's not a Cartesian take. I think people overlook that about Aristotle's philosophy. The vagueness literature. There's a recent genre of philosophy papers about vagueness or indeterminacy. There is supposedly a debate uh, between people who think there's linguistic indeterminacy and people who want to talk about metaphysical unsettledness about the world. Uh, as I say in the first bullet point there in the parentheses at the end, it, it's hard to see how one could have any bearing on the other. It just looks like two completely different topics to me. But I guess the idea is, well, are we talking about this or are we talking about that? I would say, well, we don't need to figure out whether we're talking about this or talking about that. We just need to decide whether we're talking about this or talking about that would really be the right way. Um, this literature equivocates between vague as in, as in unclearly delineated and unsettled as an unfixed. But see, the fact that the fact that something is unsettled or unfixed, whatever that might mean, doesn't mean that it cannot be precisely understood or precisely described. It just means it's not something that can be delineated as a stable object which, with fixed boundaries and fixed surfaces. But that doesn't preclude description, the precision of description. It's only that we're used to equating an object ontology with precision of description. Finally, on that slide, event ontology eliminates properties the same way it eliminates particulars. That is, it's non-atomistic. For example, I mean, a standard example is bald, the concept of baldness. So when is he bald? Is he bald when he has 789 hairs on his head? Or is he bald when he has 788 hairs on his head? And you can come up with logical arguments that are fun enough that it's going to have to be something there are you know i mean i don't care about them very much but there are, are real arguments that it's going to have to be a number but but look um if what you're naming is not a fixed state but rather a process then it, that's not atomistic and so then it, then that argument however it may go that you're definitely going to have to at some point fix the number between bald and unbald goes away. It's not the case. Um, a lot of these properties aren't actually fixed properties. They're stages of processes. Platonic metaphysics, though, is what you would expect, because the thing is, you think, OK, well, everything's uh, everything's an event. Everything's constantly changing. We know every Plato was reacting to Heraclitus. And Heraclitus says the world is constantly in flux, but that can't be. Plato says in the, the in the Theotetus, right, the argument is, well, it would be like shooting after flying game. As soon as you had a, a description of the world, uh, the world would have changed. And so any description of the world would have to be, you know, indexed to some particular time. And so Plato wanted to get to universal knowledge, knowledge that was going to be true at all times and places. And what Plato got to was uh, what essentially got to the metaphysics of mathematics. This question, I think, about the relationship of mathematics to the rest of the world. I think that's really his topic. I think it's sort of a lot the same topic as Spinoza. Um, that is that the universe inherently has a kind of formal order that's going to give rise to, what do I say, formally structured? So say you have all the circular objects, I say spherical object there, and you're gonna have these sort of geometrical um, principles, these geometrical constants that you're gonna be able to use to talk about areas and circumferences and radii and so on of circles. And it's really not gonna matter whether you're talking about metal ones or stone ones or bone ones or whatever. Uh, that is, there's just this overarching kind of mathematical structure to the world. Again, this, um, it may be an issue that um, can be addressed in physics. For example, some people claim that the uh, symmetrical distribution of the background magnetic radiation from the Big Bang is evidence of inherent a priori symmetry in the world uh, or, or the symmetrical 
clumping of the galaxies. These are not arguments that I have any particular um, interest in, but just as an example, you know, it may very well be uh, versus chaos theorists that gets us all the issue in biology, uh, whether you can get complex structures just evolving from, say, iterations of basically random things happening in much, much simpler and less organized states. That's an interesting discussion. Um, but uh, it's a discussion, I think, that doesn't go away if you take an, an event ontology. I think you can, you can think of the universe as an event and you can still appreciate the force of these platonic arguments about uh, sort of innate uh, mathematical, logical, and in general formalizable structures that we see uh, repeated in physical objects in the world. Uh, so the last bullet point, this formal structure, the good. Now, again, remember, that, you know, again, a sort of potted um, Plato is going to say, well, there are all these forms, the form of the circle and the form of justice and all that wonderful stuff. But, you know, there's the good. The good is this property that the universe has such that is formally organized. A universe that is an event could have that kind of property just as well as a universe that was an object. Uh, that's, uh, I would say. Um, the causal relationship is mysterious. Remember, they're, they're, uh, the good is not a divisible thing. There is not a multiplicity that's not located in time and space. Thus, contrary to strong intuitions motivated by the language of eternity and necessity, right? These platonic objects supposedly are eternal and necessary. How can that be compatible with an event ontology? Um, but I don't think that uh, I don't think that they're obviously incompatible with that. It's not obvious platonic forms are compatible with event ontology. That's what I would say. Well, let's move on. In Asian philosophy, I think this might be the last one. The I Ching, which predates uh, Taoism, the I Ching comes from origins in the second millennium BCE, a really long time ago. And when we get this sort of writing down of Taoism, the Tao Te Ching around the middle of the first millennium BCE, the I Ching is already fairly well. It's an old source. There you have claromancy. What is that? That's like tea reading. They used to burn turtle shells until they split and that kind of stuff. Um, in order to take a reading of the world, part of the idea there was that the world itself is a kind of whole interconnected thing. And that's why looking at this um, moment in time when we split the turtle shell or threw the sticks or, or looked at the tea leaves, you, at that moment, that was a representation of the way the world was. And a lot about, the, and a lot of the I Ching is trying to show that there are a lot of different paths one could take trying to make a decision. Should I do this or should I do that? Um, one goes to it uh, and asks a question and, and the idea is we're gonna get possibilities that might not have come to us if we had consulted uh, that. So, um, as far as substantial teaching, second bullet point, it is uh, about the flow of qi energy, a kind of picture that's reflected all through Chinese classical culture. Um, and the teaching is that being, and it's, it's not it, incompatible with Confucian in this, on this point, that um, the right thing to do is to be with the flow of nature and uh, um, uh, and that's sort of the overcoming of that self as to that third bullet point, overcoming that ego self, which is also, of course, a big part of that sub-Asian tradition of Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, karma, that is the sense that the effects my actions are having on the world and that one is going to go on being part of the world. In general, Asian philosophy teaches that spirituality is identification with the one, and the transcendence of the individual ego of the many. And so, as I say, I'm not, uh, that bears more thought, but somehow it looks to me like if you say that the universe is an event rather than an object, you're going to get a, this kind of notion of a holistic unity and a oneness. Um, that's all I can say for sure about that. Uh, all right, so, um, so I just was teaching the metaphysics seminar at the University of Puerto Rico at my was this last semester. Very nice. We had eight people, good, really good class. Uh, and, but it, the book we were using didn't talk about 
process philosophy at all. And in the end, when we got like for that chapter on vagueness and so on, I really got to thinking, you know, wow, this really is something that at least affects some of the claims made here in the standard metaphysical textbook, which I have it here with me. Yes, we do. It is, um, I guess I mentioned Lou's book, <coughs> Metaphysics. And he has other people have written supplementary chapters. Yeah. Okay, so I hope um, that was of some interest. Uh, just um, for prosperity. <laughs> okay, but in any event, if you are still listening, thank you very much. And uh, just some thoughts on process philosophy and event ontology today. <laughs>